Good morning everyone and welcome to our service here at Croftlands Community Church online. How are you all doing? However you're feeling today, whether it's up or down or somewhere in between, I hope you'll be really blessed as we spend time together in God's presence. I'm enjoying just taking a few minutes out down at the Dunner home um, sand dunes watching the sea come into the estuary. It's so peaceful and it's such beautiful surroundings and we do need to take that time out don't we to refresh ourselves our relationship with God to refresh our souls and I was reminded of the words from Deuteronomy the eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. Well this week I've been baking in my kitchen again and it wasn't hot cross buns this time it's an antidote to an illness that I sometimes have. You may have come across this illness yourself. It's called pride. Sometimes it's known as arrogance or being conceited or being puffed up or lots of other ways of describing it and it has its own signature um, songs like oh my way and Anything you can do, I can do better. I can do anything better than you. Pride is one of the biggest lurking monsters for Christians to be on guard against. And sometimes it's blatantly obvious and sometimes it can be very subtle. But either way, pride is a hindrance and is destructive and can tarnish our walk with God. Which is why I needed to make some humble pie. That's what I was doing in my kitchen this week. Have you ever tasted humble pie? Well, it's that first bite that's always the most difficult to chew on. Oh, why should I apologise to him? Oh, it was her fault, not mine. And then once you've taken the bite, pride is so difficult to swallow. Do I really have to do this? It's just not fair. But once swallowed, the antidote is released. Gentleness, being humble, meekness, humility, submission, care and concern for others, and so on, to name but a few. Pride is absorbed, eliminated, and replaced with spiritually healthy ingredients which help maintain a godly walk. Anyway, more on humble pie later. Now let's think about birthday cake. This week we have two birthdays. Mitchell, who's five years old today, and Jane G, who happens to have the same birthday as my husband, and her birthday's on Wednesday the 16th. A very happy birthday, Mitchell and Jane. May God bless you both. And now we're going to move into a time of prayer and praise. Oh, let's, let's pray to you. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the marvellous privilege we have of being able to share with you all that's in our lives, to bring to you our thanks and our gratitude, to bring to you the folk we love who need you, the issues that cause us concern, sometimes fear. Father, thank you. You know us so well, and you've made it so, so very possible for us to come and share with you. And we offer our time to you now that we're going to be spending together. Father, open our minds and our hearts and our spirits so that we hear this morning what you want to say to us, what you want us to hear, and what we want to need in our lives. Thank you for all that you enrich us with, for our Lord Jesus, for the freedom we have now because of him to come to you as our Father. And bless those, Father, we ask who need you this morning. And we remember, Father, in the confusion of today's society, you've called us to call to pray for those who are in authority over us. Lord, we need you as a nation. Move, we ask again together now, in the name of our Lord Jesus, in reviving Holy Spirit movement across our nation. Because we ask it all in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you. 
church directory is humble or to walk with humility and we're going to be thinking today of what humility means I wonder how you would define it according to Webster's dictionary humility is freedom from pride or arrogance the quality or state of being humble and Abraham Lincoln alludes to it this way it's surprising how much you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. Today, I'm going to use three M's, not M and M's as much as I enjoy them, but three biblical M's to help us unpack biblical humility, how that impacts us as an individual and also as a church. And to begin with, we're going to have a reading from Micah. I'm reading from Micah 6, verse 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So, our first M is the prophet Micah, who lived approximately 700 years BC, a, a contemporary of Isaiah and Amos, other prophets. And Micah brought a prophecy to God's people, Israel. It was a message that fluctuated between doom and gloom for the sins of, na of the nation to forgiveness and hope, great hope, for those who seek God. And we have referenced in Micah chapter 5 of the birthplace of Jesus, 
prophesied 700 years before of, of Bethlehem being where Jesus would be born. Spiritually, Israel speaks to us as a type of God's people today, the church. And so we can apply this message to supposedly Christian nations today, where God is sadly mocked and his core values are regularly rejected. Micah pulls no punches. God hates idolatry. He hates injustice and rebellion and meaningless ritualistic worship. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. As mentioned um, at the beginning, pride has a lot to answer for. And maybe if we learned humility first, we would be in more inclined to act justly and mercifully. Micah's message isn't a new one, of course, for God had given commandments and guidelines to his people many years earlier, which brings us to our second M. This M is described in scripture as the meekest or most humble man on earth. And do you know who this is? Well, it's Moses. And we can divide Moses' life into three equal portions of 40 years. And it's over four books in the Bible and in other places too. And we find a great overview of Moses' life in Acts chapter 7, if you want to, to look it up at some point. The first 40 years, we find that Moses was rescued. He's rescued from the river and taken to the palace in Egypt. If you remember, the baby boys were being killed and Moses' mother and sister put him in a basket in the river. And his own mother and sister are involved in his upbringing. But of course, he was brought up in the palace and trained to become great. Um, a military leader, a brilliant orator, a very respected man and popular. And then something happens and he has his personal downfall. An Egyptian is beating a, a Hebrew slave and Moses sees it and he reacts impulsively and commits murder. He kills the Egyptian and hides him and hopes that it, he hasn't been seen. But he is. He's been seen by another fellow Hebrew. And the next day, when he's separating this Hebrew, the two Hebrews actually, who were fighting, that one turns to him and he says, who made you ruler and judge? And that has an impact on Moses and he flees. And I was thinking about this with Moses. You know, he's described as the most humble uh, man on earth, uh, the most meek man on earth. Did position and power maybe go to his head? Um, pride, the pride of life. Did that mean he felt he had the right to kill? Did his popularity and leadership cause him to believe that his bad reactions would be overlooked and that his own people would understand because that they could see he was called to greatness. In Proverbs chapter 15, it says, humility comes before honour. And it also says in James chapter 4, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up. And so let's move into the next 40 years of Moses' life. This takes place in Midian. So he falls from palatial heights, becomes a fugitive and sinks into desert depths. And during this time, he gets married. He has two sons. He seems to get on well with his father-in-law and works for him. And to add insult to injury from the point of view of humiliation, he becomes a lowly shepherd. And the Egyptians despised shepherds. You can read that in Genesis chapter 46 verse 33 and 34. Imagine the ridicule he would have felt if the Egyptians knew about this. So Moses didn't, did really have quite a bit of humble pie to digest. He also would have had plenty of thinking time um, and I wonder again what, what was going through his mind in this period, this 40-year period would he reflect on his status, his rise and fall, the shift from being so well-known and so popular to now being a humble shepherd? Had his attitude changed at all? Did he look into the starry skies at night sometimes when he was out watching sheep and recall 
God's covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? How did he fit into God's plan now? Had he blown it? Those words, who made you ruler and judge, may have rung in his, his ears for some time, but they may, may also have prompted a change in his heart. And then, later in this latter part of the 40-year period, he meets a holy God in a burning bush and he's given a new job description. He was being asked to go to the Hebrews as their ruler and deliverer, it tells us in Acts 7. No longer did Moses see himself as being powerful in speech. And he didn't really want to go and speak to the Egyptians. And he said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And often when I've sort of read those words, I've thought, well, Moses is being a bit afraid here. You know, God said he's going to go with them. He's got this human fear reaction. But thinking about him, I wonder too if humility was coming into his heart and he was changing and emptying himself of me and self. And it's a big contrast too to Pharaoh's response when Moses does get into Egypt. Who is the Lord, he says, that I should obey him and let Israel go? Then we move into the final 40 year period. And here it goes from bondage in Egypt to promised land freedom. Here we find Moses wrangling with Pharaoh, leading the people out of Egypt, taking them through the Red Sea. The moans and groans he had to put up with from the people of, of, of Israel. His meeting with God and being taught the laws and the commandments and the pattern for worship to share with the people. Imagine, as he was given those Ten Commandments by God, how humbling it must have been as a former murderer to receive God's commandment, you shall not murder. But also, what a taste of glorious forgiveness and freedom. Finally, the promised land is in sight at a distance. But you know what? Moses doesn't make it. Why? Because he's given a task to do, not unlike one that he'd had earlier in Exodus. We can read about it in Exodus 17. But he's given a similar task to do with a rock in Numbers 20. But this time, instead of following the pattern of God's instructions as he did the first time, he did it his own way. In his anger and frustration with the people, he reacted and impulsively and ended up disappearing God and because of that he was punished consequences um, for his sin and I've always thought when God said to Moses because of what you've done you will not enter the promised land I've always thought that seemed a bit harsh and I have to say that because God knows my heart anyway so I can't hide it but I just thought of all that all you had to put up with leading the, the people um, during those 40 years and yet he wasn't going to go into the promised land and yet look at it again as Moses and his being a humble man you can see how that was working out in his life putting others before himself and so he didn't argue with God he didn't try to defend his actions and blame it on the Israelites he didn't quit and say my God I've had enough I'm running away but he continues to listen and to lead as God commands, to get the people to the promised land, even if he wasn't going to be there. And even as the journey pro progresses and God reminds him about this no entry, he doesn't complain. Instead, he beseeches God to raise up the next leader so that there will be someone equipped to do the job when he's no longer there, because he's obviously quite an, an old man by that, that point of time. And God raises up Joshua. And Moses was there in helping to train Joshua too. And so he helped, he showed humility, he honoured, he encouraged Joshua. In 1 Peter chapter 5, we read this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up 
in due time. And God was true to his word, even though this, that word was in the New Testament, but God was true to his word that he exalted and raised up Moses. He spoke to him face to face as to a friend, it tells us in Exodus 33. He's, ref he's frequently referred to his Moses throughout both the Old and the New Testaments. He appears with Elijah in the transfiguration of Jesus. He's mentioned in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. And if you turn to Revelation 15 and read about the overcomers singing, what they're singing is the song of Moses, the servant of God and the lamb. So a song of, to Jesus and to Moses. Moses is often referred to as a type of Christ whose story points forward to Jesus. And so we come to our third M. Have you got it? It's Messiah, Jesus, our deliverer, who leads us out of bondage into freedom, sets us on the way to the eternal promised land. So when considering humility as a core value, Jesus is our prime resource. And here's another reading. And now we're reading from Philippians 2, verses 3 to 11. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking a very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen! <laughs> Thank you for 
Moses has been described as the meekest or most humble man on the earth at that time. And sometimes meekness and humility seem to work alongside each other. Meekness has often been misunderstood as weakness, but a better description for it I came across is strength under control. It's about being gentle and considerate towards others, even in challenging circumstances, strength under control. Humility, on the other hand, is to do with, with crushing that ugly monster pride which gets in the way, to do with emptying ourselves of self and, and less of me and nurturing, nurturing and cultivating a humble attitude. Jesus, we, we heard in that reading earlier, gave up his position and humbled himself, even unto death, death on a cross. He chose humility. Neither humility nor meekness are, are meaning being walked over like a doormat or being wimpish. The writer Chiridi Patra sums it up like this. The mixture of these two characters are lethal. It is never weakness, but always a strength to kill the power of hatred, the power of vengeance and the power of pride. So let's look at some illustrations in Jesus' life. In Matthew 11, he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It was a wonderful agricultural analogy which the people would have immediately understood because they needed well-fitting yokes for their animals to produce the best results whether they were working in pairs, which is most usual, or, or in teams. And Jesus, brought up by Joseph the carpenter, would have probably learned the trade and may well have made or helped in making animal yokes himself, smoothing them and shaping them and so on to fit well. So he, t he calls us, he says, come, those who are weary and burdened. What are we weary and burdened with? And he says, take. So to take something, we have to make room for it. Take my yoke, remove our ill-fitting yokes and take his yoke. Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly or humble. And then we will find rest because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Jesus does not call us to a life of ease or lack of commitment or of doing nothing. Instead, it is a life of working with him, listening to him and learning from him, especially those characteristics of meekness and humility. Which yokes then need to be removed because they're ill-fitting and burdensome? Well, pride has already been mentioned, but there are plenty of others. And here's one to reflect on, legalism that heavy list of do's and don'ts. The Jews not only had God's law, the Mosaic law, but they, they created, the Jewish leaders, the oral law, hundreds of extras that they added to the list and put upon the people. And we too today can sometimes make our own religious legalistic lists. Jesus was regularly challenged by religious legalism. Take, for example, the woman caught in adultery. It was the day after the great, the, the, the feast of the tabernacles, so it was a Sabbath day, and Jesus was in the temple courts 
sitting on the ground talking and teaching when the religious leaders arrive to, trap, to trap him and they bring with him a woman supposedly caught in adultery. Now we know that Jesus was no respecter of persons and he mixed and mingled with all sorts of peoples from all sorts of status without attaching labels. He responded often with humility to the stigmatised, ignoring wagging tongues and wagging fingers and gently restoring, giving new hope. For a bruised reed he will not break and a, a smouldering wick he will not snuff out till he leads justice to victory. Jesus looks down and says nothing. He writes in the dust. We don't know what he writes. We could speculate, but we don't know. Maybe he was thinking... As son of man, he knew better than anyone else God's laws. As son of God, he knew he had come to fulfil the law and he knew his father's heart. And I wonder if Micah 6 went through his mind as he balanced justice and mercy with humility. As he looks up, his first words are to the Pharisees. If any of you is without sin, let him be first to throw a stone at her. A simple but profound statement, challenging their integrity, turning the situation around. Nobody throws the stone. They walk away. But Jesus doesn't watch gloating and with pride, he quietly carries on writing on the ground. And when they're gone, he looks up at the woman and he presents his second words, a soul-searching question. Has no one condemned you? She was guilty of death by law. She knew that, yet somehow she'd been saved, set free without condemnation, and yet also with a challenge to her integrity. For Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Giving her a fresh start. What a wonderful situation to be in. Jesus nudges us too with similar soul-searching statements whenever pride surges above humility in our attitudes towards others. When inwardly we might already have passed judgment or formed a blinkered or biased opinion of some situation. He also nudges us to question our own integrity. As believers, we are not condemned, but we need to keep our lives in order. Being yoked to Jesus is a better way, finding rest for our souls by learning of him, with him, and especially with meekness and humility and the greatness and commandment that he gives us to love God and love others. Simple but profound truths for each of us, yoked with Jesus individually and as team church. Another example of Jesus' humility is to be found in John 13 when he washes his disciples' feet. And he says, do you understand what I have done for you? I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Humbly living out what we preach is a powerful witness to Christ's servant heart. Jesus shocked his disciples at the time, washing their feet during the Last Supper, because normally it was the custom for a rabbi or a teacher to be given the place of honour. It was unheard of for Jesus, for, for a teacher, to opt to serve in humility, washing their dirty, dusty, filthy, smelly feet. He illustrates by example words spoken to disciples a few days earlier when they were vying for honourable positions in the, the kingdom to come. Whoever wants to become great amongst you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus lived to serve and died that we might live and that we too might serve others. Part of our job description as followers of Jesus is to serve others as he did, preferring their needs above our own, serving in humility. We may not be called to lay down our lives, who knows, but what sort of sacrifices, small or big, might the Lord be asking us to make in our call to humbly serve and impact the lives of others with Jesus? 
Jesus never sought glory for himself. He never retaliated when accused or tried to defend himself, though he did speak out for the weak and the vulnerable of society, and he did speak and act in defence of his heavenly Father and his will, for example, overturning the tables in the temple. True humility is to be nurtured and cultivated within the life of each believer. It's a strength, not a weakness, a crucial part of how we act and react and interact within our church family as well as with other Christians locally and beyond. God spoke to me about pride while preparing this, about some of the things I either said or thought or did, and humble pie was on my menu several times. So to summarise, humility begins with submitting to God and developing a mindset of Christ. It means submitting to each other, having an ever-learning servant heart attitude where pride and self-centeredness are unwelcome visitors. Not clinging to our rights in Christ in a selfish way, but living them out for the benefits of others that they too may experience the powerful love of Jesus. And Paul says this, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And what does the Lord require of us? To act justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with our God. May God bless you. Amen.
as our service draws to a close, I pray that God will be with you and bless you and keep you safe during this coming week. And if you have any questions or would just like to chat to someone, please do get in touch. There will be details at the end of the service. So let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.